Man, you guys can sing. I think we'll be famous for that. That's good. Amen. Well, once again, I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, homecoming uh, for us here at Bethel is, uh, I mean, it's a lot of work. And, uh, but it's not anything we're doing grudgingly. Uh, we love it. And, uh, and just enjoy uh, meeting people and fellowshipping with people. And it's, it's, I think it's good for our church people. And I believe it's good for you guys. And we just enjoy uh, doing it every, every year. And uh, we just pray that the nuclear bombs don't go off in the next year. And we can do it again next year. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, what a world we're living in right now. Amen. Amen. And uh, so it just makes you want to pray. makes you want to pray for yourself and pray for... Uh, loved ones, and um, I mean, who knows? Crazy people in this world want to kill people. And they've got really, really big, bad, dangerous weapons to do it with. And if you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus, okay, now's the time for them to know. Okay, now's the time for them to know. And I can't tell you how to approach them. I can't tell you when to approach them. I can't tell you anything like that. You'll have to ask God. But I believe God will give you the opportunity if you'll ask Him for it. Amen? That's what I believe. And so what an interesting time uh, that we live in. And um, tonight uh, and tomorrow, uh, we're going to talk about... I've, I've got some things set aside for us to talk about, but if God kind of changes my mind, and He has done that before, uh, a few years ago, on a Friday night, I was all set to teach something, and uh, after the little snack time, I was checking emails, and a guy sent me an email, and, and I read it, and God just said, help him out with that, and for like 25 minutes, I put together a brand new thing for that night, and I think the Lord blessed it, but... So anyway, I've got my mind of, of what we're going to do, but the Lord may change that, and if He does, then I'm all for that, and God will bless it, and we'll have a good time, all right? Did you bring a Bible tonight? Okay. You heard me talk about the Bible being the instruction manual of your life, okay? It is God's handbook. It is a science textbook. God created the universe with the Word, Dave Bradley. Amen. So the blueprints of everything that He created in the universe is in this book. I'm convinced of it. Science has a long time before they catch up with God on being smart. Amen. So it is a science textbook. It's a book of math. It's a book of geography. It's a book of history. And the history is accurate. And you've heard me say... If you don't believe the Bible as far as its history is concerned, why do you believe it concerning the future? Because if God didn't get it right, what happened 2,000 years ago? He's not very smart. Amen? So it is a history book, which means that there were giants. And there were behemoths. And there were dragons. And there were unicorns. And we believe in that. Amen? Okay? And so it, it is a book of everything, it is, but it, it is an instruction manual for life, okay? Uh, turn to 2 Timothy. I know that I've got that up here Some Yeah, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. This Bible has the answers. For every area of your life. This is the book of life. It is the book of your life. Okay? It's got your name in it. You ever think about that? Is your name not written in God's book? You've got God's book in your hand. Now, I don't know how it's written in there. I just believe it is. Amen? But you're, you're in that book. And if you're like me, every time an issue of life comes up, that I don't have the answer to, I go to the Word of God, and there's the answer. And it doesn't matter what page it is. It could be this chapter one day, it could be over here another day. But I found that my life so far has been in this book. Okay, Everything I've dealt with, everything I've faced, right here in the Bible. So 
So it's an instruction manual on, on life. It's an instruction manual on how to be a good husband, how to be a good dad. It's an instruction manual for ladies on how to be a godly woman, how to be a good wife. That wasn't no man's amen. That's a woman's amen. Amen? <laughs> It'll instruct your children on how to be good, godly children. Amen? Amen? And it's mom and dad's responsibility to teach them that. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that. Okay, T Tell it to your generation and their generation to come. It's an instruction manual on marriage, on life, on family. It covers the workplace. It covers the voting booth. It covers medical science areas, things that you can do medically, and we're learning now things that we're not going to do medically. Show everybody your t-shirt. She made a t-shirt, it's got DNA on it, it's got scriptures of Psalm 139, and then the letters DNA is an acronym for do not alter. <laughs> You'll wish you brought a hundred t-shirts with you, okay? Huh? Take orders. There you go. They are. They're, they're, they're neat. That's, that's a good idea. I like that. Uh, but anyway, the Bible's teaching us that they're not going to approach us with a genetic modification. If they want to do that to carrots and peas and potatoes, that's their business, but they're not going to do it to us. And this Bible teaches us that, Okay? So it is the instruction for every area of life. And so what I kind of thought of doing, uh, I, made, I, I haven't decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this tonight, and at some point it may stop and change keys, because we're going to talk about the day of the Lord, okay, and what that means, what it implies. The day of the Lord is coming, okay, it's coming. And for those who are ready... This is going to be awesome. For those who are not, it's not going to be so good. And again, if you know some people that are not right with God, now's not the time to ignore them. Even if all you do is pray for them day in and day out. Well, God can listen to your prayers, can He? God can save people that you can't reach, can He not? You pray for them. Now's the time to not ignore people that need to know about the Lord because the day of the Lord is at hand. And there's several meanings to that, but one of them is it's within reach. It's right here. There's another meaning to it too. Josh, it has to do with the hand. Okay, You're shaking your head like you know. I haven't even said anything about it. So you just have to wait on it, all right? Anyway. This is the, so I may, I may get to a point here and stop and I say, okay, let's, let's do something else for a while, all right? And just kind of make it interesting. But I wanted to just kind of lay out some very, very simple things on how to know what that Bible says. How to know it. How to believe it. How, how to study it. How to use it. Uh, who was it? Ken was saying to me that, he said, it's a shame that I have to have a shield of faith inside of a church fending off false doctrine. That's a shame. Okay? And so it'll teach us all these things. Psalm 38, Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I will teach thee, instruct thee in the way. And I will guide thee with mine eye. Proverbs 1, eight. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. God is your father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 4.13. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her. For she is thy life. You stop and think about that. And I talked about this on PMO here a few weeks ago. The church is a her. And when God sets his word in the midst of a congregation of people that congregation becomes wisdom. And wisdom, the Bible says, wisdom crieth out, out in the streets. And the things that we say and do in here, we're not trying to hide from the world. We're putting it out there on the internet so that 
the wisdom that is in this church crieth out to those who would come by and hear it. That's how come you're here tonight. Amen? Is that God sent forth the word from this place and you were going down the street of YouTube. YouTube Avenue. Okay? Or Facebook Lane. Okay? And, and you saw something there and you started watching it. So that, that's how that works. Anyway, but our Bible, all scripture, Genesis to Revelation, everything in this book is for our instruction. It is for our doctrine. It is for our reproof, for our correction. You pray for a man. I was on the phone with him for 50 minutes. When I got done today, I was, man, I was like, because he called all the way from Germany. And he was an, he was an American, but he's living in Germany. Called all the way from Germany to correct me on water baptism salvation. And I just, I just, well, let me tell you what, here's what the Bible says right here. Here's that, these people asked, uh, uh, they asked Peter or Paul, what must we do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then he said, well, yeah, it says that, but then you got to be baptized, water baptized, be saved. And I just going, and I just went round and around and around circle with this man for 50 minutes. And you know what? And I figured out, he, he, he started out by going, we just love you, Pastor Mike. Oh, we listen to you all the time. Oh, we love the King James Bible. Really? Why don't you believe it? If you're wrong on something, let the Bible show you that you're wrong and just admit you're wrong and say, you know what? God's true and every man's a liar. Amen. This, that's what this book is good for. It is instruction for dummies. I'm glad you all came tonight. <laughs> Exodus 31, 3. He said, I filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. The knowledge that you're going to gain from the Bible is going to come by way of the Spirit of God. It's going to give you wisdom and understanding and knowledge. 1 Kings 4.29, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. 1 Chronicles 22.12, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. You're here... Because you want to hear the word of God. Don't come here because you want to hear me. Okay? You're here because you know that what I'm going to do is what I'm doing now. I'm just going to give you scripture, 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 scripture. Who is it that's going to give you wisdom? God is. Who is it that's going to give you understanding? God is. How is he going to do it? He's going to do it through this book. Okay? That's how he's going to do it. Job 12, 13. With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Job 28, 28. Unto man, he said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So that's what your mom and dad tried to teach you. With a belt or a rod or a switch. Who in here ever had a switch? Who in here from a you don't know what a switch I was going to say, where's our aliens that don't know what a switch is? My mother would make me go out in a willow tree and get a big, long, thin, wobbly branch off that willow tree and peel the little leaves off of it and just leave this really long, wobbly stick that stings. Oh, it stings. And my mom would take a switch to me. Mm, that's the rod. Amen. Um, she was teaching me wisdom by teaching me how to depart from evil. How not to follow the guys that live down the street. If, yeah, if you're sitting in this church, look in the little hymn book holders for little wooden spoons. Right? That's how we raise children around here. You ought to be glad you don't come here. Amen? Because even Roy gets it every now and then, don't you, Roy? Psalm 49.3 My mouth shall speak of wisdom. And the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Proverbs 1.2 To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive, here it is, to perceive the words of understanding. What you want is you want to be able to read this Bible 
And one verse at a time, you want to be able to know it and understand it. And then in that knowledge and in that understanding, God gives you the wisdom of life that you need. He wants to teach us doctrine so that when some guy calls you and says, you need to be water baptized, you can go to the King James Bible and say, that is not what this says. And you can study the issue on your own and you can learn the difference between baptism in the water pool versus baptism in the soul. And I asked the man, I said, do you believe that the water of a baptistry washes the soul clean? He said, no. I said, then what are you thinking? Because my flesh, even if it's washed in water, is not going anywhere. It is staying here in this earth to corrupt and then to burn up. It cannot be washed by the Spirit. It's, it's defiled. And if it gets washed one day, it's going to be dirty the next. And, but he, he, he just, there was, like, there was a brick wall there and a stone of a fence was there in front of him and he could not perceive that. I feel bad for it. You pray for it. I mean it. You pray for it. Because he is, he's just way out there. And he, pre, he kept pretending like, because he knew I was getting mad. And I kept telling him, look, I'm not going to listen to this nonsense. I'm going to get off the phone here. I've got other things to attend to. I've got people waiting for me downstairs. I need to get off of here. And every time he would perceive that I was about fed up with him, he would try to sweet talk me. Oh, we just love you, Pastor Mike. Proverbs chapter 2. My son... If thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Here again, it's in his words. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. So, you're reading Daniel chapter 9. And if you're like me, you're going, there ain't no way I understand that. That's just, even the, even the English structure in the book of Daniel, the last few chapters of the book of Daniel, is hard to follow. So, should I take a shortcut, go on YouTube and find out what somebody said about Daniel chapter 9, 10, 11? No. I, there's something that I've got here that I'm going to give it to you now. If you're reading something out of the Bible and you don't understand it, I'm going to give you one very easy method of overcoming and then understanding it. It's called wait on the Lord. Because if you'll wait on the Lord, God will open your eyes one day. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. How many of you used to believe in other translations of the Bible and then God brought you to the King James? God opened your eyes, didn't he? But he did it at a right time. Okay? He waited and he made you wait and then in the fullness of times, he opened your eyes to it. Okay? So if you're struggling with something in the Bible right now, wait. Just wait and that God will fill in the details for you. Okay? Uh, Proverbs 23, 23. What do those numbers add up to? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth, sell it not. When you finally get a hold of the Word of God, don't give it up, Ken. Okay? Don't turn away from it just because the church is or a church is. Stick with it. Ecclesiastes 2.26 For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy... But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes 10.1. Watch this now. Dead flies cause the appointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. What's he talking about? A lot of times old-fashioned rubs and liniments and ointments, a lot of times they were made out of the base of it was pig lard or some sort of animal fat. Well, flies love fat. Okay? And what would happen was, I mean, this is just common sense stuff. The flies would get on there and get stuck in that ointment and they would die. 
and you found flies in your ointment, and all of a sudden you're not interested in rubbing that on your back anymore. Okay? Think of a spiritual application of that. Dead flies are like the preachers and the scholars and the seminarians who are all about saying the Bible is not translated right here. The Bible's there's there's an error here in translation. A better translation should have said this. Those are dead flies. You know why? Because they don't help you. They don't help you in any way. What was you telling me about? Who was it? Somebody was telling me the preacher said something just wacky about something in the Bible. Was that you, Ken? Oh, that the, the root of the word for love in the original Greek was a, a bunch of grapes. And so when God loves you, He gives you a bunch of grapes. And I'm just going... That's dead flies in the ointment of the apothecary. So doth a little folly to him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. How many of you would like that reputation? Wisdom and honor? People come to you because there's just something in you. They hear something coming out of you that they never heard before. And they're drawn to that. Okay? Don't foul that up with dead flies. Amen? And you and your reputation with people and your neighbors and your family members, because they know you. They can hear in your house sometimes. Your family members know you. And you're trying to live for the Lord. And the devil would love to trip you up in front of them so that then they would say, See, I knew they were like that. That's dead flies in the ointment. Amen? Look at Daniel 1.17. And as for these four children... Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Think the Gospels. Think spiritual realm. God gave them knowledge and skill. And who, who gave them knowledge? Who gave them learning and wisdom? Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God gave him that. That was a gift from God. Okay? Got it from the Word of God. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches. Both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Ephesians 1.17 That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. See, it's a spirit. And the spirit always accompanies the Bible. Amen? Always accompanies the Bible. Um, Colossians 2. Verse 2. That Let me... Increase that a little bit. There we go. That our hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who in here, be honest, you like those little treasure-finding games on your phone, hidden treasure games. Anybody? Uh, we got one saved person in the whole building who's admitting it. To be honest with you, I like that. Now, I'm old school, okay? On my phone, I've got a copy of Minesweeper. Who remembers that one? Windows 3.1, Minesweeper, okay? Because if you know how to read the numbers, you know where the mines are. And that's kind of, I like to keep it simple, okay? I like to know where the mines are, okay? I like to seek out hidden treasures. I do. I like mysteries. I like secrets. I like things like, I like... A treasure chest that has a lock on it, and I know there's a key in that room somewhere, and I'm going to find that key. Okay? That's me. That's my nature. I like things like that. This Bible is full of treasures for you. It's full of them. And all you got to do is open it up and start reading. And you'll, you'll trip over them. Amen. Okay? Now, verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and this I say... Lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That's happened, hasn't it? People have tried to entice you. They've tried to beguile you. They've tried to get at you doctrinally with what you stand for and what you believe. They've tried to poke at you. They've tried to chip away 
at your foundation because they think that you're not standing on anything and they think it's going to be easy to knock you over. What they don't know is you're standing on the solid rock, the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, and you're not easily moved because you believe the book. Amen? Isaiah 33, 6, and wisdom and knowledge. This is really what I had in my mind for tonight. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Okay, now, we're living in a time right now. You go on the news, you look at Drudge Report, you look at some of these places. We got a president now that's not going to kneel down before North Korea. He's not going to bow down. He's not going to sign the check over to him. Okay? And good or bad, that's what we've got. And God is going to shake the heavens and he's going to shake the earth. And when he does, God's people are going to need stability for their times. Don't get me wrong. I like to hear the older generation talk about how church services used to go back 40, 50 years ago and revival lasted two weeks and people were saved and this and that. Yeah, I like hearing that stuff. But I don't live then. I live now. And the things that God has in His Word for me are for right now and for my stability living right now. So... You need this Bible now more than anybody has ever needed it in the past because if we are that generation that sees these things come to pass, we're going to need every bit of this. We're going to need wisdom and knowledge to be the stability of the times that you and I live in. Amen? Now, you've seen me use this picture of the menorah, the candlestick. Okay, uh, Sister Deborah Cleveland up in Ohio, bless her heart. She's the one that called me with this and showed me. She said, Pastor, I don't know if you've ever counted those decorations on that candlestick, but there's 66 of them exactly. And I just, I went, oh, I get that. The Holy Ghost, here's the seven spirits of God. Here's the Holy Ghost. The light is in the 66 books of the Bible. Okay. Now, you're, here's wisdom for you right here. Okay? Now, it, it, I just want to throw this at you very quickly, and I want you to ponder this for a while. This candlestick was in what, what they called the sanctuary, the holy place. The table of showbread was there. There was a, a, an altar of, of incense there, and then there was the candlestick. It, this room did not have a window. It had a door, but that, that door stayed shut all the time, and then you had the most holy place. The only light in this room was to be from this candlestick. Now, out of the seven candlesticks that are sticking up, which of these candlesticks lighted the north end of that room? And which of them lit the south side of that room? Who said they all did? That's what I'm getting at. What that means, it's very simple, but I want you to get this. The light that God is going to feed your soul with is not just going to come from one little tiny section of the Bible. It's going to come from Genesis. It's going to come from Leviticus that you don't want to read. It's going to come from that genealogy list that you went... Okay, and they begat, and they begat, and they begat, and they begat. Okay, here's David now. That's, listen, you just turning the light out. That's all you're doing. Just turning the light out. Did you, do you not want wisdom? Who said that one day God's not going to lighten your soul with profound wisdom and you'll be able to track the source down to the genealogies one day? Who's to say? Because if it's in the Bible, it's got light in it. And it doesn't matter what candlestick is pointing in what direction of that room, that whole room was lit by all seven of those candles. You see where I'm going with this? It's the whole Bible. It's not just one little section. And the guy, see the guy was arguing with me on the phone. 
Because I brought up, I said, okay, let me ask you a question. I said, David in heaven? Yeah. I said, how was David saved? Did he get baptized? I said, what about Enoch? Did he get baptized? What about Elijah? Where was his baptism? And I just went through the whole list of like Hebrews 11. All these people that, he's, well, they got saved by the Old Testament law. I said, wrong. I didn't have my buzzer, but I wish I did. And what he wants to do is, well, that's the Old Testament. That's not for us. Baloney. Baloney. The whole 66. Every bit of it. Read, read a little bit of his this part one day. Read a little bit of that part the next day. Amen? Now, I'm going to just give you some, some real easy tips on how to know the Bible. Rule number one. Read it! Amen? The word read is 70 times in the King James Bible. I just found that today. I'm going, okay, that's pretty cool. Okay? You're not going to get anything. Now, listen to me. You come here at the homecoming weekend, and I'm just throwing verses at you one after another. You're going to end up forgetting 95% of everything I said this weekend. Go home and read it. Okay? Go home and read it. Deuteronomy 17, 19. It shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. When are you going to stop reading the Bible? When you draw your last breath. Okay? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Isaiah 34, 16. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. The the Ephesians 3, 4. Whereby when ye read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Would you like to understand the knowledge of the mystery? Read it. You've got to read it. Okay? It won't soak in under your pillow at night. Okay? Read it. Get used to reading your Bible. How much a day? That's up to you and the Lord. Some of you might read a chapter a day. Some of you three chapters. Some of you might read... 20 chapters a day. To each his own measure. But read it. Read a portion of it every day. Read it. Read it morning. Read it in the evening. But read it. Read it with Christ. Revelation 5, 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. If you're going to read it and not invite Jesus to read it with you, you're wasting your time. He's the only one qualified. And unless he opens the book for you, it's going to remain sealed and shut and closed. Amen? So let God read it to you, but read it nonetheless. Rule number two, believe it. Okay? Now, let me narrow it down to what I mean when I say believe it. I mean, if it says dragons, you believe dragons. If it says giants, do not put nephilims. That's not what it says. It says giants. If it says six days creation, that's what you believe. Okay? If it says the Red Sea parted, that's what you believe. Whatever it says and whatever word is in your King James Bible. My advice to you is believe that word is the exact right word that God chose for the stability of your times. Okay? I keep, Ken, you shouldn't have talked to me before church because I'm I'm just, I mean, he comes, he's sharing his his burden with me because... He goes to a church and in their bylaws says we only use the King James Bible. But he's going there and people are bringing in all these new Bibles. And the preacher's up there behind the pulpit correcting just about every verse with Greek and Hebrew words. Saying, well, in the original Greek it really says grapes. That's what love means. Love means grapes. Okay? If the Bible, if it uses this word, then believe this word here. Okay? I'm not against you getting a dictionary and out looking, well, what does this word mean and things like that. And I'm not really opposed to looking at the Greek equivalent of that. But don't use it to correct the Bible. 
God did speak it in Greek. He did speak it in Hebrew. There was a reason for it. There was a reason for Greek. I get all that. You might, you might get a little nugget of wisdom every now and then. But if it says this, then you believe this. Don't change the Bible. So that's what I mean by believing it. Because I promise you, the day that I submitted to God, surrendered to God on this Bible, and I said, this Bible's right, was the day that I vowed to God that I was not going to look in an NIV anymore to try to figure out that verse. I was not going to look at the lexicon to try to see if maybe that word should be translated differently. I decided right then that if it said these words, then I was going to believe those exact words were the words that God wanted me to know. And when I started doing that, that's when I started learning things that I never would have learned otherwise. Okay? Psalm 1966, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe thy commandments. See how he connected it there. If you'll believe it, God will teach it to you. Isaiah 53, 1, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This Isaiah 53 is about Christ on the cross. And here's the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian eunuch reading this passage. Who hath believed our report? Well, he ended up believing it. And he was saved. If that guy from Germany is listening, he was saved before he got baptized. I pointed that out to him, and he said, Yeah, but! Said, no. He was saved before he ever got in the water. Amen. John 2, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. They believed it. Acts 4, 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them was about 5,000. Romans 4, 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He just believed what God said. Uh, you've heard me uh, talk about this. Turn to Genesis 22 very quickly. I'll give you an example. Okay? I, I want to try to set you up with it, but to, I've said this too many times, so you guys probably know where I'm going. In Genesis 22, we're... God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Okay? What's the matter, Dave? Got gas? He's going. What's the matter, Dave Bradley? He did not tell, God did not tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Read your Bible. Look what he said. Offer him there, verse 2, for a burnt offering. Offer him. He did not tell Abraham to kill Isaac. He told him to offer him. What did Abraham do? He fulfilled what God said the moment he laid him on that altar and took the knife in his hand. He didn't have to kill him. God did not tell him to kill him. Because if God told Abraham to kill Isaac and then an angel shows up and says, don't kill him, What's, what's Abraham supposed to do? Kill Isaac. But God did not tell him to kill Isaac. He told him to offer him. Did you know the NIV here says, sacrifice your son? But that is not what God said. So you see how just this is just one place in the whole of the Bible where if you'll believe what's written versus what you thought you remembered or what somebody said, you now are smarter than they are. You've got wisdom and knowledge that exceeds them because now you know that God does not alter the thing that goes out of His mouth. Ponder this for a minute. Even if God said to Abraham, sacrifice your son, and then God Himself showed up and said, don't sacrifice him, God is a liar. He has altered His own word. He sent his word forth, and it did not do that which he sent it out to do. God did not change his mind. And now, when you read, now when you read this, you'll never read it the same way anymore. Because now you know that God did not tell him to sacrifice him, told him to offer him. And that's precisely what Abraham did, offered him. See, it makes a difference, doesn't it? So if that word's in your Bible, then believe that word and don't believe what anybody else says. Amen? Okay? 
Uh, they believe the scripture and the word. How be it many of them? Well, we already read that. Let's go here. Romans 9, 33. As it is written, behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That rock of offense, turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 2. The rock, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense is the Bible and Jesus. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In fact, I'm going to stop right here and get into this believing thing. Do you believe what you just read? Do you believe it literally? You should. Okay? The Bible calls you a lively stone. When Jesus returns and he establishes his kingdom for a thousand years, he's going to have a house that he's going to live in. What's that house going to be made of? Living stones. His saints. Literally. Remember what Jesus promised? I can't remember what church it was in the book of Revelation. But he said, to him that overcometh, Will I make him a pillar in the house of my God? He did not say, I will pretend that he's like a pillar in a make-believe house. He said, I will make him a pillar. The house, the literal house that Jesus is going to inhabit and dwell in for a thousand years is made up of things that are not present on this earth. It's us, his saints. And I cannot even fathom what that's going to look like. But nobody on this world has ever seen such a beautiful house as the one that the Lord is going to build himself. And it's going to be us. Literally. That's what that says, right? And he says we're a holy priesthood. And by the way, he says it right here. A spiritual house. So you know what that means? A house made of spirits. <laughs> and then look at the priesthood is going to offer up make-believe, fake, metaphorical, non-existent sacrifices. Because that's what some people say the word spiritual. Well, that, that's spiritual meaning of it. Which means make-believe, fake, mythological, allegorical, but not tangible, not real. Can I tell you that there are a lot of spirits that need to be cast into the fire? Right? And God's priesthood, His saints, are going to throw them into the fire. The beasts. Amen? That's what you'll get when you'll believe these words. Okay. How much of the Bible is literal, do you think? I've got it in my mind that all of it is. Okay? And that's another thing. When God, when I was reading the Bible and I would see things like that, the Holy Ghost would say, Mike, stop right here. Think about what that means. Think about what it's saying. That's not an allegory. That's not just some fable. That's not just some pretend thought thing in your mind. That's exactly how it's going to be. Amen. Um, oh, what I was, I was, uh, first Peter two. Uh, let me get back here where I'm supposed to be. Verse six, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Believe it. But unto, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Ken, doggone it. 
Every time your preacher gets up behind the pulpit and says, a better Greek translation is this, he is disallowing a particular stone out of that verse. He's rejecting it in favor of a man-made stone in its place. So what he's doing, slowly but surely, he is removing the stones that God has set in and he's replacing it with man-made stones. A house built by the hands of man, not the hand of God. And God won't dwell in it. Amen? God will not dwell in it. So, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the what? At the word. Now let me help you out with something, okay? Uh, when it comes to, I'm going to sit down here for a minute. When it comes to people getting into it with you, over the Bible and over a lot of these issues, okay? Number one, they probably are fishing for you. They're hoping to hook you and reel you in with arguments that they think that you can't win. Okay? And 99 times out of 100, they're using stink bait to do it. Rotten stuff. Hey, Amen. It's no good. Okay? So anyway, number one, be careful about falling into somebody else's trap that they laid for you. And if you want to answer somebody, quote scripture. Because then you're never wrong. Never will be wrong if you'll just quote scripture. Okay? So, when it comes to, like people calling me today and throwing all this, well, you've got to be water baptized and water this and water that. Okay? Their problem is, is that they have stumbled at the word because they're disobedient. And they want you to stumble with them. So what they'll do is, they'll come up with what I call stumbling stone verses. They'll show you a verse out of 1 Kings and a verse out of 2 Chronicles that look like they're supposed to match up, but there's differences in them. And they'll say, see, that proves right there there's mistakes in the Bible because these two things say something completely different. Those are stumbling stone verses. To the people who want to believe there's mistakes all through their Bible, they're going to trip over every one of these. And they're going to fall. Rule number one, there's no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you hear somebody that says they found a mistake, refer to rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. Okay? Just don't play their game. Quote them scriptures like, uh, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation ever. Just quote scripture to them. And pretty soon they'll, they'll get so mad they'll shut up and start calling. That's when they start calling you names, by the way. Well, you're an idiot, turkey. See, I won. Right? But they're disobedient. And they stumble over these verses. And they want you to fall with them. You don't have to. You don't have to. Just do what Jesus did. Just quote scripture and make the devil go away. Amen. First Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. Very important to remember because they will tell you, well, the Bible written by men. That's why I go to the Catholic Church. I didn't make that up. That's what somebody said. I go to the Catholic Church. The Bible's written by men. Oh, good grief. If you want, it, if you want God to give you wisdom and have that wisdom to be the stability of the times that you're living in, then you recognize that none of this Bible came from the evil heart of man. That every bit of it came from the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It is not the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? Believe. Believe. Did you know that really it's not up to you to apply the word of God? Well, the Bible says this, so I guess I better be doing that. 
Rather, it is up to you to believe the Word of God, and God will bring the application in your life. Is He not the vine that bears the branches? Is He not the husbandman that purges off even the branches that are unfruitful in your life and makes things so that... Just ask, how many of you are happy in the Lord right now? Say amen. amen. Who made you that way? You? Well, I was reading some verses in the Bible about being happy, and I just decided I'm happy. That don't work, does it? I was down in the lowest pit you could think of, and I cried unto the Lord, and I read some things from the Word, and I don't know what happened, but just a few hours later, things just started getting better for me all of a sudden, just out of the blue. That's how it works, isn't it? That's what that says. The Word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe. You let God worry about the legs that are on that word and what he wants to do with it in your life. You just believe that God said that. And God will do all the work. Amen? Amen. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So, rule number one is, read it. Rule number two is, believe it. See how simple that is? Rule number three. Ready? Meditate on it. Think on these things. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are... By the way, we're going to get to the counting part in a little bit. Number it. Count it. Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise. Eight. Think on these things. Because eight is the number for renewal. New heavens and new earth on the eighth day. Uh, circumcision on the eighth day. It's about the new life, okay? A new heart, new beginnings. And we are, re the Bible says we are renewed in knowledge. So eight, to me, fits this perfectly. Before you were saved, you voted for Hillary Clinton. Hey, just saying. But now that you're saved, you start think, you think Bible. And God is renewing your thoughts and your philosophies. And all of a sudden, the things that you swore were right, you know they're wrong now. And you're thinking differently. So... Reading the Bible, that's one thing. But then, meditate on it. Think about it. Think about what it said. Joshua 1, 8, verse 8. It's 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Think on it. Meditate on it. That means, turn the telly off and the YouTube. And Facebook. And get a Bible out and read it. And then sit for a while and think. And let God direct your thoughts. As you meditate on His Word. Now, that's, that's a simple thing to do, but you can meditate on the Word like when you're going to work. Think about the Bible. Think about verses. Okay? And you'll have one of these moments where you'll get some, God will show you something on the way to work. You'll just have to pull over and read it and write it down somewhere so you don't forget it while tears are in your eyes. God will do that for you. If you'll take the time to meditate on His Word. 
His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 119, 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Verse 23. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Verse 48. I will meditate in thy statutes. Verse 78. I will meditate in thy precepts. He's thinking the Bible. He's thinking the way the Bible is. And I was talking to this guy on the phone. I could tell. He had gone to a Church of Christ church all his life. And that's what was fed to him out of the pulpit for all of his life was, got to be water baptized or you're not going to heaven. All these Baptists, they got their false doctrine. And that was so ingrained in his mind, it's like he had been inoculated against the truth. And I tried, to, I begged, pleaded with him, please just listen. Look at what that verse says. And he could not get past you got to be water baptized. I feel sorry for him. Okay? Think about that. Think about, not about what a preacher says, not about what God, Mike says, or what some other YouTube guy says, or whatever. Think what the Bible says, and how it says it, and the exact words that it's using when it says it. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. That means he stayed up late thinking about the Bible. What better way, if you're, if you're just going to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning anyway, what better thing to do than just lay there and think Bible verses? Then read it. 1 Timothy 4.15 Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And it all comes by, number one, reading it. Number two, believing it. Number three, meditating it. Number four, ready? Search it. Search that Bible. Proverbs 2, 3. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her... As silver and searches for her as for hid treasures. I should have added Candy Crush and Fruit Ninja and what's that pigs game? Angry pigs? Angry birds? All of it has to do with a way of doing something, right? Search the scriptures. There's, listen, there's more candy to crush in the Bible than you've got on your iPhone, amen. Search that Bible. It's got treasures in it. Things that when you read it, tears come in your eyes. Because you say, God, why did you show me that? I'm rotten. God, I'm filthy. I'm no good. God said, I love you. I want you to have some new treasures for this week. Amen? Husbands, don't you like buying your wives some nice jewels? Amen? I, well, I, I asked that question the wrong way. I didn't, I should, I should, don't ask if you, do you like buying them for her. I should say, doesn't it kind of make her happy when you buy her nice jewels? Amen. Well, God, Jesus gives us nice treasure jewels out of the Bible. And when we know these things, they are an adornment of grace. They're an ornaments for us to wear of what God has shown us in his word. Proverbs 25, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Have we found everything that's in this book yet? No, we're still reading, aren't we, Josh? Okay? But then every now and then, God concealed it, but the honor of a king is to search it out. Okay, God, I know you got it hidden in there. I'm going to find it. Amen? Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. God's concealed all kinds of nice little goodies in this book. When you get sick of watching television, you know what my dad, my dad's so smart. You know, my dad, we all grew up in an age where in the St. Louis area, we had five channels on our TV. Four of them we could get. Down here, the fifth one we couldn't get very well, okay? And when I first got my first satellite dish on my house, getting 180 channels, Dad, I got 180 channels. 
I said, man, I just watch that thing all day, just flip around the channels. He said, yeah, if you got that many channels and you can't find something on TV to watch, then watching TV is not what you want to be doing. And he's right, because now I've got like, I don't know, 500 channels, and I don't watch most of them, if any. During the day, I just, I don't have time. I don't want to anymore, not like I used to. There's better things. There's better things here, okay? So find those treasures. John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Acts 17, 11, these were more noble, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. See, I'm wanting to get mean here and I don't, I don't know if I want to get mean. You guys are so nice. Okay? But it's not flat. It doesn't say it is. Okay? And the problem is, you didn't search the scripture to find that out. You searched YouTube. And I'm telling you, I'm on YouTube. And the worst place in the world to get wisdom from God is YouTube. And Facebook. Don't get your doctrine. That's not going to be the stability of thy times. This book is. Search it. Search it out. Whether those things be so. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. All the Old Testament men, you know what they did? They were searching the scriptures because they wanted to understand who Christ was because he hadn't been revealed to them yet. But they searched it anyway. So there was enough people in the time of Christ that when he came, God just brought alive the word in them. And when they saw Jesus, they knew it was him. Just by seeing him one time, they said, that's him right there. Boy, that's something, amen? So... Number one is, read it. Number two, oh, no, believe it. Number three, meditate. Number four, search it. Number five, read around it. And in all things that I've said unto you, be circumspect. Circum is a circle. Spect is what's hanging down our nose, guys, right? I, used to, I worked with him when Lisa and I first got married, and I used to laugh at him, and I'm going, why is he always doing this when he's looking at something? And then I got my first pair with him on it, and I'm going, yeah, okay. I still laugh at him, just for different reasons now. It'll all catch up with me, won't it, Sterling? Amen. But be, in all things I've said unto you, be circumspect. It means, look around. And when somebody, like the guy on the phone, I mean, I know, I, know their motive, I know how they operate, their modus operandi, their method of operation. I know how they work. Let's take one little skinny verse, let's isolate it from the rest of the Bible, and let's prove ourselves to be right against the whole rest of the Bible. And what he did was, he went to, I think it was uh, Acts 15 or 16, where the, the jailer got saved, and um, he, he deliberately skipped over a portion of Scripture, and I pulled it up on the screen, and he said, see right there in verse 32, it says that they went to their house and was baptized, every one of them. Yeah. Uh, how come you skipped over verse 30 and 31? Well, I didn't. I said, well, yeah, you did, because right there it says they asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I said, you conveniently left that out. Okay? And I'm telling you, that's what they'll do. The wolves are out there. They may not be able to get you, but they're going after your family members. They're going after your children. 
And the way they do it is to skinny isolate one little verse from the rest of the Bible, try to prove themselves right. And if you will do this one thing, if you will just take that verse, look it up, and read around that verse, God will give you the truth of what they're trying to lie to you about. Okay? Ephesians 5.15, see that you walk circumspectly and not as fools, but as wise. Hebrews 8, 1. This is one of my favorite things in the Bible. You, you, when you think about the Apostle Paul, in everything that he taught, he was always laying out a case like he was a lawyer in a courtroom. And he would say, what shall we say then to these things? And what he's doing is, he's giving you a whole teaching, and then he's going to give you what, what's up here. Now, of the, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. What that means is, that's in Hebrews 8, chapter 1. So if I were you and wanted to know what that was talking about, go read the first seven chapters of the book of Hebrews. And build up to that verse so that you will then adequately understand that verse the way Paul, the Holy Ghost, laid it out for you to understand it. See, the Holy Ghost, in teaching you, He's going to give you a foundation. Then He's going to build up the house. He's going to give you the roof for it. He's going to give you this whole building of doctrine. But it's going to start in the basement. And if somebody just tries to... The devil tried to slip Jesus one little skinny little verse out of the Bible, didn't he? See how it works? Don't fall for these people. Don't fall, If you're reading some guy's book and he makes some big statement about how God's going to do this and then the second coming is going to be like this and he gives you 14 verse references... That it's going to try to make you think that what the, all these verses say exactly what I said. I dare you to stop and go look every one of those verses up. Because I almost guarantee you the Bible doesn't say what he said. Okay? So, when I'm up here teaching, I don't just say, Exodus 23, 13 says it. Ephesians 5, 15 says it. I don't know why you don't believe it. I'm going to give you the whole verse. And if that's not good enough for you, then get up, walk out, go in the foyer... Get your Bible search software out, look around what I said, and then come back in. Say, okay, you're right, I just had to check. Read around it. What was that, number five? Number six, compare it. Compare it. Isaiah 28, 9. Turn there, turn there. Let's spend a little time here. Y'all getting tired yet? I am. Yo. I, I, I pulled that verse up after I got a phone with him. What he's saying is, John the Baptist, you know, he said, I've come to baptize you with water and repentance, but there's someone coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And see, what he told me was that water baptism brings the Holy Ghost. And I said, you're lying through your teeth. It said it does not. The Bible does not teach that. These people received the Holy Ghost. He said, well, Paul got baptized when he got saved. I said, no, he got saved on the road to Damascus. Then he got baptized when he got to Damascus. The Ethiopian eunuch did not get the Holy Ghost after he come up out of the water. He said, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Because remember, flesh and blood doesn't reveal that to someone. The Spirit does. That eunuch was already baptized by the Holy Spirit of God. And they just happened to pass by a baptismal fountain. Right? No. It was a body of water. They got in it. Amen. Amen. But I'm just telling you, the lying crowd will use little skinny portions of Bible to make you believe Something that's not true. Don't fall for it. That's why, that's why I do what I do. Because one of these days, I'm not going to be here. I don't know when that's going to be. But I know I'm not going to be here forever. So I have a responsibility to not build you up based upon me. Because if I died tomorrow, or next week. 
What are you guys going to do? I want it said. I want it said. If anything happens to me, and I get to go to heaven, I want the last thing on your mind about me to be, he wanted us to read the Bible. So if I can get you hooked on reading this Bible, I can go home and you'll be just fine. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Spencer, God's looking for people that he can teach. He's looking for simple people. People that say, subtle. <laughs> People that put pineapple on their pizza for some reason. <laughs> He's looking for working hand people. Blue collar people. Retired people, grandmas and grandpas and little children Amen. to give them wisdom. He wants to teach them his doctrine. Okay? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Let me just say this. I, this I'm not trying to be vulgar, but a woman has two breasts. One Old Testament, one New Testament. Amen? See, the milk of the word comes from the breasts. And there's two of them. Old Testament, New Testament. Okay? And, I mean, again, I'm not, I hope I'm not embarrassing myself in front of everybody. But a child draws from one one day. And a few days later, he'll draw from the other. So read your Bible. Read a little bit of the Old Testament. Read a little bit of the New Testament. Then go back and read some more old. Then read some more new. It's all the same milk. And we need it. Amen? I'm hoping I didn't embarrass myself. <laughs> Verse 10. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little. And there a little. For with stammering lips. Old Testament. Moses. And another tongue, New Testament, Greek, will he speak to this people? To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear, but the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Who is that written to? It's written to Israel. And their problem is they will never understand who the Messiah is because they only have line. But they don't have line upon line. They have a little here, but they don't have a little there. And they'll never make the connection of who Jesus is until they do what you and I do every day. Here a little and there a little. Amen. Comparing spiritual things. Oh, that's another verse. Isaiah thirty four sixteen. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read it. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. So understanding, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you read a verse and you say, Lord, I don't understand what that means. PureBibleSearch.com Or do it the old-fashioned way. Get a concordance, a lexicon of every word in the King James Bible. Big, I've still got one in my office. Strong, exhaustive concordance of every stinking word in the Bible. All the A's and ands and, and ands and thes in there. And if you want to do it the hard way, do it the hard way. Okay? Which is what we had used to do a long time back in the old days. Remember that? Okay? But we now have tools. I'd use them if I were you. And you've heard me say this. There's no reason for our ignorance anymore. We can search the scriptures and do what the Bereans did in a matter of hours. Find something out. Okay? As this guy was lying to me on the phone, I had the pure Bible search software pulled up, and I'm going, I'm going to nail him with this. All I need for him to do is breathe, and I'm going to jump right in there. Okay? It's, it's just getting scripture. But they're mated together. 
You'll start seeing the Old Testament types and shadows. You'll start seeing the doctrine. You'll, you'll, start, you'll know the doctrine in the New Testament. You're reading the Old Testament one day and you're going, wait a minute, that's what Paul said. That's the doctrine that he laid out in Hebrews. That's it right there. You'll see a picture of it. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of, of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I made a promise to God. I'm not going to read commentaries. I'm not going to change the English back into Greek and Hebrew. I'm not going to consult Dr. So-and-so. I'm not going to watch the next episode of Jack Van Apey Presents. I'm not going to do that. God, if you want to show me something out of the Bible, I'll wait for you to do it, but you show it to me in the Bible. That way I'll believe it. That way I'll know it. Okay? Compare, you're going to compare things in the Bible. Don't step out of the Bible in order to understand a symbol in the Bible. Okay? You, you'd be reading this Iron Kingdom thing in Daniel chapter 2. And this, you'll hear a preacher say, Now, in ancient biblical times, iron was used to bring grapes to people that somebody loved. That's not the Bible. God never said that. I'm going to give you something else too. Watch out for these Hebrew letter people. Oh, this Hebrew letter here, that's a word picture. And what that means is this. And what that word picture means is that. And when you take this one Hebrew word and you dissect it down to its word pictures, you get a whole hidden meaning out of it. Watch out for that. Because I'll tell you what set me off against these people doing that. Because they said that Aleph represented God. It was the first letter, Aleph. And the ancient pictogram of Aleph was an ox. And I went, they changed the glory of God into a corruptible image of a four-footed creature. That's what they did. That, listen, that Bible has got a verse in it for every stupid thing the Jews come up with. God will reveal it to you right there in the Word of God. So when these people start saying, now the gematria of this particular word, these letters add up to this. Show me in the Bible where God gave numbers to the Hebrew letters. It's not in there. Show me in the Bible where God assigned let numbers to the Greek letters. It's not in there. You know what that means? God doesn't say it. You shouldn't believe it. Amen? Amen? But it's so easy for us because we're always, we're always wanting to find out things, the cool things, the neat things that nobody else knows. That's who we are. And the mistake that I made was going off in this stuff and God pulled me back and said, Mike, that's not in the Bible. That's not anywhere in the Bible. Why are you following that? You're right, God. It's not in the Bible. I don't believe it. I don't see in the Bible anywhere where God is an ox. Amen. So that was number six, right? Number seven. Number it. Count it. Revelation 13, 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and six. What does that number mean? What is, what is it going to look like? I don't know. But if we'll read the Bible and meditate on it and think on these things, when that mark shows up, we'll go, I know what that is. That's the mark. That's the mark. And all of a sudden, all these verses that you've had just laying in your mind will go, there it is right there. Because remember, when prophecy is given in the Bible, the people in the Bible always best understood it after it was fulfilled. Like Jesus spent like three and a half years telling them, I'm going to die on a cross. Third day they're going to raise me from the dead. And they're going, yeah, pass the biscuits, Jesus. But when he rose from the dead, they went, oh, he told us that. It makes sense now, right? Okay, so you may not know 
what 603 score 6 really means and what it's going to look like and how it's going to be this chip and how it's going to do it. We may not know that now. But if we're that generation that sees it, we'll know it. Amen? Ecclesiastes 7.25, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness of madness. In verse 27, he says, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. So can't, God uses numbers in the Bible. And I did. I read um, a book by E.W. Bullinger on Bible numbers. And I read what he had to say about what he thought the numbers meant. And then there was an independent Baptist preacher, Ed Velo, who wrote a book. He's now gone on to be with the Lord on uh, the numbers in the King James Bible. And he had a list of the numbers. And so I read that list and I read his book. And when I got done, I said, okay, God. Sounds good. But I don't know that I know for sure that what these guys said that number means, that that's what it really means. So God, if you want me to know what this number means, then you show it to me in your word, and then I'll believe it. Okay? People, it's that simple. You're sitting in God's classroom, and God is your teacher, so who are you going to ask for help? Ask the teacher. And he will teach you things. He'll teach you profound things. Amen? But he'll teach you how to count things. Leviticus 23, 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days. God was in numbers. Deuteronomy 16, 9. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Psalm 90, 12. So teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. See, there again, the third time he said that we count things and teach us to number things so we'll have wisdom from it. Okay? So you're reading... You know, Romans chapter 1, you see that list and you count the list of all the wicked bad things and you find out there's 23 of them. And then it says right after that that he committed such things worthy of death. 23 is the number for death. Genesis 23 is all about death and the burial of Sarah. Matthew 23, 23rd chapter of the New Testament, you know what's in there? You're full of, you're, you're whited sepulchres, full of dead men's bones, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. In Matthew 23, he was telling you there was death in the leaven in the doctrine of the Pharisees. Okay? So count things. Isaiah 53, 12. He was numbered with the transgressors. And I'll never forget. I was studying that number three, and I saw three crosses on there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He was numbered with the transgressors. Daniel 9, 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. The wisdom and knowledge of the 70-year prophecy was Daniel's stability. He needed to know that God was not going to cast off Judah forever. He read it in Jeremiah that he was going to accomplish 70 years. And after 70 years, I'm going to bring them all back, Daniel. Don't worry. I haven't forsaken my people. Amen? You'll need that one day. You'll need to read the Bible and know something from it and know that God has not forsaken you. Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. That's an accounting term. It's a ledger. You have a ledger full of sin. And what God did for you, because you believed Him, was He took the ledger and, and all the sins that were in your ledger, blotted them out to zero so that how much, do you, how much now do you owe God? You owe God nothing. He counted it for righteousness to you. You have no sins. Behold, He findeth occasion against me. He counteth me for His enemy. On and on and on. So that's numbering it. What is that, number seven? I've only got 20 more things, so hang with me here. <laughs> Double it. I think, let's see here, how much do I have? Well, I got quite a bit. I got more in my back to hold up tonight, all right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind it down with this. Let's double the scriptures, shall we? God speaketh once, yea. Now think about the profoundness of that. You have how many testaments in your Bible? God speaketh once. New Testament, God speaketh twice. Jesus is the Word. 
He came the first time, that's God speaketh once. He's coming again, that's God speaking twice. And since He is the Word, the Bible says that God sent His Word out and He didn't send it out void. It's not going to return to Him void. He's, what He sent it out to do, He's going to do exactly what He sent His Word out to do. Jesus did not make any mistakes at His first coming. He did not leave off of any of the instructions that His Father gave Him when He came the first time. But He's not done. He's going to come again. God's going to send forth His Word again, Jesus, to do exactly, remember what Jesus said, I come in the volume of the book. It is written in me to do thy will, O God. So even at that, it's doubled. Genesis 41, 32, and, uh, 32, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. You remember the dream that Pharaoh had? He didn't just have one dream. He had two. You know why? God speaketh once, yea, twice. Even when Joseph was going to give the interpretation of the dream to his brothers, he had two dreams. Right? Okay? When God speaks, remember, he speaks twice. Exodus sixteen five, And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Why did it have to be twice as much on the sixth day? Couldn't gather on the Sabbath day. Okay? So that was God... Uh, doing it twice. Psalm 62, 11, God speaketh once. Twice have I heard this. Job eleven six, and he and that he should show thee the secrets of wisdom that they are double to that which is. You want to know the secrets of your Bible. You want to know the joy of reading the Old Testament prophets. And I used to really struggle with this before God showed me this because I'd try to read, you know, Isaiah and I'd try to read, you know, Malachi and I'd try to read Jeremiah and I'm going... Why am I reading something that happened 3,000 years ago? Okay? And then God showed me that whatever was fulfilled out of Jeremiah was only partially fulfilled. God was going to fulfill it perfectly in days to come. And I went, maybe I'll go back and read this again. Look at, uh, look at uh, Jeremiah 51 since we're talking about Jeremiah. Aren't you people getting tired yet? I'm wore out. You're killing me. Um, where did I say? Jeremiah 51? Let me make sure I meant that. I may have been thinking... Um, I know it says it somewhere in Jeremiah 50 and or 51. But I know in Revelation 18... He says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why twice? Babylon is fallen once. Babylon in the last days has fallen twice. How many times did Dagon fall? The first time his priest lifted him back up. I think there was a major power of Satan's kingdom destroyed when Christ died on the cross. And Dagon fell. And the priests had been picking him back up, rebuilding him, setting him up for the last days. He's going to fall again. And this time he's staying down. Isn't that cool? Okay? That's how you read this Bible. Just know that if you think it's already been fulfilled, God still got parts of it. Huh? Thank you, Dave Bradley. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her? For uh, Take balm for her pain, if so she may be healed. Yeah. Babylon is fallen. Verse 7, Babylon being a golden cup in the Lord's hand. I mean, there's all kinds of wisdom in here. So read it, uh, you know, in the book of Joel. The book of Joel. You'll see all kinds of partial fulfillments on the day of Pentecost. But the sun and the moon haven't been darkened and the, the moon hasn't turned to blood. The stars of heaven have not fallen and that mighty army has not come out. I mean, I'm telling you, there's things in Joel that have yet to be seen. So that's kind of exciting in a way to know that there's going to be a generation of God's people that's going to see the fulfillment of everything God said in this book. Amen. So double it. 
Uh, 2 Kings 2, 9, it came past when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. The Holy Ghost poured out the second time in the last days to Israel. Israel receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how many verses can I, what, what can we do here? Yeah, there it is right there. Revelation 18, 5, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. That's why Babylon has fallen once. Babylon is fallen twice. So, uh, we look at places like, um, go to Isaiah chapter 63. No, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to, um, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus got up to read this in the synagogue. He opened the book and he found this place, Isaiah 61, 1, and he starts reading. When he gets to, to proclaim the acceptable the year of the Lord, he stopped reading and closed the book. Notice there's a comma there. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He did not mean the whole of Isaiah, the whole of Isaiah 61. He stopped reading, closed the book, and he said, we're going to do this right here and right now. But what that means is, he's going to come once again, Stevie, and he's going to open that book. And the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, the day of vengeance of our God is going to be poured out on this earth. God's not done. Jesus is not done. The Holy Ghost is not done. But I think I am. Amen? Okay? So, when you're reading, when you're reading the, the prophets, understand that even though they might, you might see a partial fulfillment somewhere in the New Testament, understand enough to know that God speaketh twice on that and that He's not done fulfilling. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Are you glad you came tonight? Amen. Amen. So you're going to believe it, read it, meditate on it, search it, compare it, uh, read around it, circumspect it, number it, double it. Just start with reading it, okay? And believing it.